Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, today's program, Digital Governors and Public Sphere Beyond COVID-19. Uh, my name is Jeff Howe. Good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, today's program, Digital Governors and Public Sphere Beyond COVID-19. Uh, my name is Jeff Howe. Good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, today's program, Digital Governors and public sphere beyond COVID-19. Uh, my name is Jeff. Good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, today's... Okay, sorry about that. Let's start again. <laughs> I think there was some uh, ghost in the machine going on here. Yeah, it's worth speaking three times. Makes it important. Right, right. <laughs> okay, um, so my name is Jeff Howe. I'm a faculty member in the Taiwan Studies program at the University of Washington, uh, Seattle. And uh, it's my honor to serve as the host of the program today. Uh, the Taiwan Studies program at UW was established in 2017 uh, with a mission to promote research and education on Taiwan society and culture. In today's program, uh, we would like to bring attention to a growing area of activities in Taiwan and the rest of the world, uh, the emerging practice of digital governance and its impact on the public sphere during and beyond the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, with the format of this uh, event as a small example, the current pandemic has uh, propelled transformation in how uh, communication and deliberation take place, how information gets uh, disseminated uh, and also curated, and, and how decision-making is facilitated. Uh, historically, uh, in liberal uh, democracies, these activities constitute what we know as the public sphere. Uh, now, as the public sphere become increasingly the domain of digital uh, governance, uh, what has changed uh, and what has not? Well, what will be the impact on democracy and social life as we know it? Uh, to help us uh, tackle these questions, uh, we are joined today uh, by the person who is uh, most knowledgeable about uh, the topic, uh, Taiwan's Digital Minister, Audrey Tan. Uh, welcome to the program, Minister Tan. Hi, good local time, everyone. Great. Uh, and we're also joined today by two experts in the area of public space and urban uh, design. Uh, first, uh, Kevin Xu, who is a, a senior assistant director at the Center for uh, Livable Cities, Singapore. Uh, and uh, also formerly a researcher at the uh, UIA Digital Planning Lab, uh, as well as a lecturer in the D School at uh, Stanford University. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. Uh, next, uh, Henry Thieben, who is Associate Professor and Director of the MSc in Urban Design Program at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he's also one of the initiators for the 2020 The Year Without Public Space webinar uh, series uh, that set the stage for today's event. Uh, Professor Thieben. Uh Welcome to the program. Uh, uh, for today's program, we'll spend the first hour or so going through a series of uh, questions. Uh, and then we hope to set aside the last 20 minutes or so to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, for the audience who are watching on YouTube uh, right now, uh, you may type in your questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, I think it's, it's to your right. And uh, we have staff working behind the scene to uh, collect those questions in addition to the ones that we have already collected uh, through the registration. Okay, so now uh, let's begin. Uh, the, the year 2020 has... Uh, uh, it's almost at the end, uh, and we are now more than nine months into the pandemic, uh, at least according to WHO. Uh, what has been the role of digital uh, governance, uh, including open data, civic tech, uh, and so forth, in addressing uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis? And uh, in what area has it been the most effective, uh, or perhaps not? Uh, so uh, perhaps we can start with Minister Tan. Okay, um, I think digital is the most effective when it plays a assistive role, as in assistive technology, assistive intelligence. I always emphasize the most important is the physical vaccine, the 
uh, mask, the chemical technology that's hand sanitizers, including uh, soap and alcohol sprays, and then maybe digital technology. Uh, and so if the digital technology is there to assist people to remember to wear a mask, to protect ourselves from our own unwashed hand, then that works very well because it enhances the agency of each individual. If on the other hand, um, digital technology is built to like the replace the role of human contact tracers, then it doesn't work that well. And so this uh, is just to, to set a stage. Now, how would digital technology actually help to remind people to wear a mask to protect their own against their own hands? Well, we have this cute analog dog uh, called Zong Chai, the Shiba Inu, uh, the official spokes dog of the social media campaign of the Central Epidemic Month Center. So when I tell you to wear a mask to protect against your own hands, you may remember, but you probably will not share the message that easily. But when the very cute dog tells you not doing this, like literally not putting your fingers in your mouth or something, um, you will probably not only remember but uh, actually, because this is so cute, you will probably share it. Uh, and the same goes to, for example, the physical distancing rules. When you're indoor, keep three of those cute Shiba Inus away. And when you're outdoor, keep two of those away from each other. And so this is a communication designed to be remixed, to be kind of mimetic, to be like a vaccine of the mind because you probably cannot unsee this after seeing the cute talk. <laughs> and so you will probably not believe the conspiracy theories concerning physical distancing or, or masks because you've <laughs> already laughed about it. And this is the digital communication strategy that we call here humor over rumor. And that is the uh, beginning of my response. But I'd like to hear from others too. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about these kind of everyday uh, digital technologies, uh, in addition to the one that may be more advanced than most people. Yeah, the, the daily communication, basically. Uh, so there's a technology, I'm, I'm not sure even if it's digital, it's called uh, TV broadcasting every 2 p.m. So every 2 p.m., the Central Epidemic Command Center does this broadcasting for more than 100 days during the pandemic. And people actually just tune in uh, every 2 p.m., kind of listening to it like a podcast or something. Uh, and so the Quint, the five medical officers, uh, just provides a very to-the-point uh, response to all the questions that all the journalists ask. And so based on the press freedom in Taiwan, sometimes they have to feel very interesting uh, questions, but always the commander Chen Shizhong uh, works with a kind of humility uh, saying, oh, that's a really good question. Oh, why don't you teach us? Uh, or things like that, like working with the journalists instead of against the journalists and also enables another, I'm not sure whether it's digital or not, technology called a toll-free number and a call center. Okay, okay, I guess this is digital. Uh, and so anyone who calls 1922, the hotline, can actually get their kind of slowly repeated the version of the 2 p.m. press conference. If you happen to miss it, or if you don't understand some of the details, you're free to call 1922, and someone from the call center will patiently explain to you. But some people call it to, to complain. For example, back in April, uh, there's a young boy who called to complain, saying, uh, we're rationing our mask, and all he got was pink medical mask. And he doesn't want to wear pink to school because pink is for girls, uh, and he, people will laugh at him, uh, and so what to do? And the call center people doesn't know what, how to answer that. And so it got escalated to the CECC. Now, the very next day, all the medical officers wore pink medical mask, regardless of their gender. And so, in a sense, the gender mainstreaming uh, becomes the, the most cool thing. Um, and I think the commander, Chen Shizhong, the minister, even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. Um, and so, for a while, we, we all have those pink medical masks. Uh, and the, the, yeah, the, exactly, you see that there, too. So the popular brands um, actually colored their uh, social media avatars pink. Uh, as well, and that massively increased the likelihood of people wearing the mask, not just uh, for safety, protecting against their own hand, but also to make a statement. So this, uh, the rainbow part, will also uh, be quite popular uh, when we had a pride parade and things like that. And so this all increased the basic transmission rate of signs and clarifications and ideas that's worth spreading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. It really gave us a, a sense of what is really on the ground uh, in, in Taiwan. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Director uh, Xu, do you want to respond to this question? 
Um, sure. Um, so Singapore has also been quite proactive in using digital tools to support the efforts of our multi-ministry task force on COVID-19. Uh, in the early days, uh, working very rapidly to move from concept to product, uh, the GovTech agency put together a Bluetooth-based protocol called BlueTrace. And in Singapore, um, a trace together app using this protocol can be downloaded onto a smartphone, which allows health authorities to know which other trace together users have been encountered um, by the phone's user. Um, but one thing to note is that all the close contacts are actually stored on your own device and not sent to the government. So only when a person is found to be coronavirus positive um, and then uploads the data, only then does the government have access. And GovTech actually made this protocol open source so that other governments interested in utilizing it, um, as well as advocates who might be concerned about privacy, could actually peer into its workings and be reassured about its capabilities. So that was one example of kind of a use of a digital technology um, but I think some other very practical ones as well. Um, so Singapore, we actually implemented um, a circuit breaker from April to June when essentially people were asked to stay at home and not come out very much. And during this time, however, people still needed to access uh, essential services such as buying food from supermarkets or going outside for exercise. And the Urban Redevelopment Authority, uh, that's our planning authority, planning and conservation authority, um, we had our digital planning lab actually developed a web-based resource called Space Out, um, and it allowed the public to actually see real time and historical crap levels of different premises, such as malls or markets or post offices. And then they could actually choose where and when to go to purchase, uh, purchase things or to um, access those services. And the National Parks Board also used drones and human counters to track how crowded parks were to make that information available online. So residents could also go out to safely exercise. So it was really putting that type of information um, at people's fingertips. And um, I think as the minister mentioned earlier, kind of giving people um, the ability to make that right choice. Mm -hmm. right. Professor Teven, do you want to respond? Um, well, for me, uh, first of all, um, I had the opportunity to stay uh, the first five months uh, of the pandemic in uh, Taipei because I was at that time there, basically came over Chinese New Year and and got stuck in a way there and then worked then online. Um, and so I, firsthand, I could see those, uh, the impact of, of uh, all those ideas and I was very impressed. Um, so I, I missed that particular period in Hong Kong where I'm working. Um, I think, uh, of course, in, in Hong Kong, I would say compared to, to many other uh, parts of the world, maybe because Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan went through, the, uh, went through SARS, that in general, I think in in, in international uh, context, it is relatively okay, right? Uh, um, in terms of digital tools, there were very early already those kind of maps where you could see exactly where an outbreak uh, would be. Uh, I think what was a little bit different to to the Taipei version or Taiwan version was that. Um, I think in, in Taiwan was never revealed any kind of personal information. Um, right. Here, um, it was relatively easy potentially to spot exactly which unit it is, right? Uh, so that might be good for safety reasons, but also uh, create potentially anxiety. We have uh, recently, we have a uh, system with QR codes, um, but it's not a must to, to check into those, right? Uh, but I think that the most important parts in Hong Kong were probably more the reaction of the civil society because many people just went through SARS and were just kind of so mm -hmm. panicked and, and, and or not panicked, but uh, so aware and 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 and, and scared and, and really immediately started to wear masks and, and try to be careful. And I think if the numbers are low, I think it's it's very much linked to this, right? And then otherwise, I think in terms of digital uh, device, of course, uh, what kept probably many places alive is also di digital food supply and so on, right? Of restaurants and so on, even though we, we can go to restaurants. Um, but I think that's another level that many places have, but also here started very early, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, so moving on quickly to our next topic, uh, the public sphere has uh, long been a critical component of liberal democracy. Uh, free uh, exchanges of ideas, for example, are important in shaping public discourses uh, that in turn hold uh, the government uh, accountable. Uh, how do you see uh, digital technology and governance reshaping the public sphere? 
the, the formation of public opinions, the, the public discourses, the, the system of representative democracy, uh, and so forth, uh, beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Thibon can, can start for us. Yeah, um, well, I think that we saw overall that the pandemic basically didn't bring like entirely new things, but it's basically more created uh, earlier tendencies gained much more momentum and were boosted. And uh, so we have all kind of, uh, let's say, online communication, online education, online shopping already existed before, but they were just kind of boosted to a scale that, that was never there before. Um, and they affected maybe the use of physical public space, but uh, not necessarily so much the, the public sphere. Um, then on the other hand, we saw that there's an increased use of, of digital tools for surveillance, right? Uh, and uh, also uh, restrictions uh, in, in some countries uh, of um, press freedom. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I recently read this fantastic book uh, uh, by uh, John Barry, um, the, the great influencer in 1918-19, right? Um, and uh, you could see maybe basically almost everything that we are talking about now, uh, the restriction of press freedoms, uh, fake news and so on, or were already there at that time more in the United States and in Europe. And today we see it here in some places in, in Asia. Um, and they might kind of erode uh, the, the political culture, right? Um, the, uh, the other thing is, I, I believe, as we have seen also, or, or a reason to have this event, right, that, that we have new digital tools, obviously, that, that also uh, create new opportunities, right, for, for uh, digital governance or new forms of um, exchange of ideas, like, like the initiative that we had, it's kind of a very small one, but, but where all of a sudden it's possible to, to link with people in six continents uh, and, and discuss about experiences and so on, and, and it's almost for free, right? Uh, those kind of things uh, uh, didn't exist before. So, so I think we see those kind of different tendencies, I would say. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Tan, uh, you have a lot of experience setting up you know, platforms for these kind of you know, public deliberation. Uh, th th does this spill over into the larger public sphere or what are some of the lessons that you have uh, come across? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, one very good case study uh, before the pandemic was the Airbox uh, initiative. In Taiwan, there's a lot of people who are concerned about PM 2.5, which probably cannot be intuitively felt, but uh, people do feel the effect of PM 2.5 in air pollution. Uh, instead of waiting for the government to do anything, people just bonded together uh, and installed those very low cost, like less than 100 US dollars um, air boxes, uh, usually actually in primary schools as the teachers teach data competence, uh, digital competence, uh, data stewardship, and things like that. Uh, it's actually much easier to teach if the students are in a data producer role rather than just a data consumer role. Um, and so all across Taiwan, you see thousands of those air boxes and uh, sharing their data of real-time PN 2.5 measurements uh, to a distributed ledger. Um, and also the Academia Sinica, the National Academy, supports the algorithm that calibrates those air boxes and so on. Uh, and so this is accountability, right? This is the citizens giving an account of what a um, pollution level is like to each other. And but it started by the social sector, by the people. Uh, and then they will pressure the public sector saying that, hey, we see those missing points here, what happens there. Well, it turns out these are industrial parks and the primary school teacher probably cannot break and enter industrial parks to install those air boxes to complete them up. But because they already gain so much legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the public sector. So the EPA has to work with them instead of against them. Uh, and then we set up the civil IoT system, uh, and then we started installing those air pollution measurement devices also on the lamps in the industrial parks because it turns out the municipalities own uh, those lamps. Uh, and so this is the people-public-private partnership. It's the social sector setting the norm, the public sector completing the norm, and the business sector working with the norm. And this has been the case also uh, of the PPE supply. 
So starting early February, uh, pretty much the same mapping technology has been used to track the availability of masks in pharmacies. And people who queue in line can see uh, with their own chatbots or things like that, or voice assistants and so on, the real time uh, inventory. So when I see someone queuing before me, swipe their national health card and get uh, 10 masks, then I know that they purchased 10 masks because it's refreshed at most every three minutes. Uh, so actually it was 30 seconds every 30 seconds in the beginning. And so because of that, people who queue in line are engaged in participatory accountability. They don't have to blindly trust the national health insurance uh, about the numbers, which would be the case if we publish daily. But just like air boxes, this published every minute or so, so that ensures people who queue in line can keep each other in check if they see somebody swipe their card. But rather, the inventory increases. They will call 1922 right there. So that is part of the public sphere, but built by the social sector. That's great. So we, we, we're really talking about sort of governance from the bottom, right? So we often think about governance as this kind of top-down mm -hmm. uh, process. This is really sort of a distributed uh, mm -hmm. you know, governance from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Director Xu, what, what do you think? Well, I thought it was really great when the minister was sharing about this idea of um, citizen science, and it was really neat to kind of see um, the connection between kind of online with offline projects or offline presence. Um, I think that exchange of ideas and education, bringing people up to speed and training them on how to use these tools, um, that's a really good use of uh, digital technologies. Uh, it really reminds me of some of these open online courses that we put together um, um, at Stanford um, and really tried, I think the potential of course was there to educate people about certain topics, right? Whether it's math or computer science, but the ones that I found really exciting were the ones that these courses may have had a social mission or a public interest goal. And um, it was really a, a great way of kind of adding to the public discourse about these topics and then making sure everyone is equipped to kind of have a conversation about them. And in those kind of settings, I think for these open online courses, right, sometimes called massive open online courses or MOOCs, I think what was really important is not just the course content itself, but also uh, the ability to actually build communities, so convene people and then um, bring them together into conversation. and. Uh, let them have the tools for having a meaningful and positive exchange. Um, I, I will say that doesn't always happen um, naturally. And so kind of thinking through what are the ways you actually um, have um, a positive kind of community building experience is, is quite important. And I think recently in the US, um, we've actually seen um, kind of an uncontrolled um, situation, right? Where um, it's, it was very prevalent during like the COVID-19 pandemic and the election season, you get basically false posts on social media. Um, and, you know, essentially there had some people claiming the pandemic's not real. Um, you had a lot of fake news that's distributed online that contributes to a coarsening of public discourse. Um, and I think in this whole digital realm, um, it'd be great if corporations, I mean, they, they essentially, they can influence or amplify certain types of speech. Um, for instance, by recommending videos that might claim like the earth is flat, for example, right? So we've heard of those types of algorithms um, and it's, it's really done through algorithms sometimes, not always through explicit editorializing. Uh, and so if, if these algorithms are basically tuned toward user engagement or mind share or monetization or provoking certain types of behaviors, um, then they really have to be administered very responsibly. Um, and that's why kind of in the citizen science case or in a classroom setting where it's a little bit more, it's not as wild west, um, you have a chance to really craft the type of engagement and craft the experience that the students or the participants are able to enjoy. And I think that's like a really powerful use of the tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so speaking of uh, citizen science and uh, you know, education, uh, I mean, you know, obviously some communities might be better equipped or prepared uh, to, to be engaged with that. Uh, so I think one of the most critical lessons uh, of the pandemic uh, has been the, the impact of disparity uh, between different people with different uh, social economic uh, standings. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, people at the bottom of the social ladder, uh, you know, tend to be uh, in worse, you know, situation under uh, specific housing conditions or uh, inability to work from home or lack of uh, health care. And uh, so how can uh, digital technology or digital governance address uh, this uh, disparity and, and does it, aggravated through uh, the digital divide and, and how can such divide be uh, overcome? Uh, so 
perhaps, uh, uh, Director Xu, uh, can you continue with your, your thoughts? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, well, digital tools certainly can help us diagnose challenges and give it a spatial dimension and then work to solve it. Um, I think one interesting thing is like in the United States, they've been tracking ethnicity related to coronavirus cases alongside other important demographic information. And that let us know that some minority communities such as uh, black, Latino or indigenous communities in some states are actually being harder hit. Um, I'd say like when we think about um, disparity, um, even with the advent of new technological solutions, uh, maybe not everyone has access to the same technology um, or is not digitally literate in the same way. I am older people, for example, may or may not know how to download and use a smartphone app. Um, so in Singapore, the government's actually manufacturing and distributing physical tokens, which use that same blue trace protocol I mentioned earlier. Um, and they're much easier, these physical tokens for senior citizens to just carry around. Um, I think if we kind of return to the realm of urban planning and the use of digital technologies and disparity, um, and especially if we're thinking about this new normal that will come after uh, the pandemic, uh, it'd be great to use digital tools to actually assess equity and evaluate if all residents are doing well under a certain planning scenario or if there might be um, communities that are underserved. Um, especially, I think not everyone's going to experience public space the same way. Um, and we understand through the pandemic how important having access to public spaces. And so um, that same demographic information, things like age, ethnicity, linguistic group or native language, physical ability, uh, I think all those things are important to understand because what's good for like the average person that the planner looks at may not actually end up serving all members of the community because people do have distinct needs. Um, and so I think I'll just close with um, a point that it's really important that we actually make amenities accessible, walkable and reachable for all. And in the US, we actually have had studies that show some minorities have less access to green space, for example, um, in cities. Um, and so if we know this, um, we can try to amplify voices that aren't usually heard in the planning process and make sure everyone's needs are met. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Minister Stan, what, what has been your experience uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, addressing issues of disparity? Yeah. In, in Taiwan, of course, we have broadband as a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, no matter how remote, even on top of Taiwan, the Savia or Pedagunung or Yushan or Jade Mountain, many names, um, because we're a transcultural um, country with 20 national languages. Uh, anyway, so even on the top of Taiwan, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second at just 16 US dollars per month for unlimited data. Otherwise, it's my fault, uh, like personally. Uh, we, we've had people um, like complain, like um, who literally wrote emails saying, it took me four attempts to send this email. I'm in a quarantine place near the Yangmingshan and in this particular site near the mountain, I don't have uh, telecom reception. I have to go to the other end. You promised Robin is a human right. Uh, and so two weeks after that, we installed a new telecom tower. So anyway, the, the point is that we're really committed to broadband as a human right. Uh, and this is the basis on which to build, for example, the universal healthcare system, the single payer health system that then made it actually more um, accessible for people to get a mask from a local pharmacy to go to a local clinic for a diagnosis. Um, if they develop something like COVID symptoms, uh, it's actually cheaper than drive-through testing. And you can't say that in pretty much anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, and that made actually the support uh, very grassroots so that a local pharmacists uh, who are trusted by the elderly people, the elderly people doesn't know how to mo uh, work with a mobile app, that's okay. They just take their uh, physical token, that's a national health card, which is IC card to the pharmacy. And with the same experience as getting a refillable prescription, they can get not only the mask, but also pretty good advice uh, from the pharmacies. We had a choice uh, earlier on to start deploying mask rationing uh, based on mobile payments or real name um, uh, easy cards uh, in convenience stores. But we consciously chose the pharmacies because it will empower the people who are closest to the pain, who are elderly, who don't know how to use mobile payment and things like that. And also because it increases the trust, trustworthiness of the pharmacist system. And so uh, I often say that the national health insurance is a social democracy. We're a social democracy when it comes to health and 
and learning or a liberal democracy otherwise. <laughs> but it is actually very important that those pharmacists do have uh, fiber optic connection, more than 90% of them, uh, like uh, lining fast uh, to the National Health Insurance Agency, which enabled the mask rationing to go uh, without congesting people like long lines and things like that due to the lack of broadband access. So this is the most important thing to be assistive in helping the help us in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, you wrote somewhere about, you know, uh, bring technology to people rather than bring people to technology. Yeah, rather than forcing people to technology, in, indeed. Right. Yeah, this is a great example. Uh, Professor Thieben, what do you think? Uh, well, I think that uh, the, the point of the pharmacies is, is quite uh, interesting, and I remember a, a common friend of, of us, uh, uh, I mean, they can, uh, uh, was um, writing about or, or, or thinking about how, how important in Taiwan the relationship between the very high density of pharmacies in the first place is uh, and, and might have also contributed mm -hmm. to the success of the, the mask uh, system and so on, right? Um, because uh, that in itself is already a kind of amazing infrastructure, right? That mm -hmm. uh, then you can build on on top of that, right? Exactly. Uh, in in Hong Kong, I think that um, well, in general, the the number of infections and so on were relatively low. But I think as as it was also in New York or in other places, the the question of health disparities is of course quite quite important. No? And um, for example, we we were studying with. Uh, um, NGOs together, the situation of people in the subdivided uh, flats, for example, units which are very famous for, for Hong Kong, right? Um, where people just live on a uh, less than uh, the space of a parking lot or, or maybe half a parking lot, right? Um, and uh, I think that in general, the, the access to internet, uh, most people have some form of an inter, uh, internet access, but there were under the pandemic some kind of shortcomings. Uh, one was that libraries were one of the places that were uh, one of the first places closed, right? And uh, many, particularly living in this kind of very crowded conditions, uh, particularly kids would usually go there to study for the exams and so on, right? So, you, so those spaces all of a sudden wouldn't be there together with the universities and so on. With the need then to for for the kids uh, then to to stay the whole time home in this kind of very uh, confined uh, situations. Uh, of course, they can walk around in the city, but but because also, for example, that's then where they if they have internet, where they would have internet, and then under these conditions, all in one room, and then two kids maybe parallel having online class. Uh, I mean, then also you need to have really a good internet and so on. So in the detail. There are a lot of kind of issues that that uh, are very much uh, related to this kind of very dense living conditions and uh, the access to to affordable housing and so on that that were um, brought even more stronger to to the foreground. Right. Uh, on the other hand, I think there Hong Kong has this kind of uh, amazing system of a lot of NGOs that uh, uh, and, and civil society that. That tries to help by by uh, providing maybe Zoom uh, uh, discussions with the, uh, elderly and so on, and, and finding some other ways like how to support local uh, communities. Sorry, right. go yeah. ahead. Yeah, no, uh, this was just from my part, and that I think it's it's probably what we see. Also, when we had these discussions with with our webinar series, the question of uh, health disparity and uh, uh, crowding and so on that that uh, uh, are very different from urban density itself. No, because we can see, like for example, Hong Kong, uh, Taipei is very dense, but it's not necessarily said that you have more people infected by the street in that kind of crowdedness and and uh, health disparity. The lack of maybe. Uh, health insurance, or or here in the ACE one, but it's maybe not not as strong as in other places. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. These kind of you know, the social infrastructure is is sort of an equalizer uh, to kind of deal with issues of disparity. So for uh, those who have uh, just joined us, uh, uh, before we move on to the next question, uh, for those who are watching on YouTube uh, right now, you can type in your question in the chat box uh, to your right. Okay, so so next, uh, uh, we, we talk about these kind of bottom-up uh, 
governance uh, and the phenomenon of that uh, in Taiwan and elsewhere. Uh, but you know, we still have a, a government. Uh, and uh, in, in most part of Asia, uh, the, the culture of civic engagement is still emerging. Uh, there is a, a strong kind of resistance from the state democracy, uh, state bureaucracy, uh, towards you know, civil engagement on issues such as urban planning, uh, which is often entangled with urban, urban politics. So, how can uh, digital governance help address uh, issues like these? Uh, uh, Minister Tan, uh, Tan uh, have you had any experience with applying uh, uh, digital tools to urban planning? Yeah, quite a few, actually. We, we run every year uh, the presidential hackathon, which is for the social sector to work with public servants and the business sector on those three months prototypes uh, projects. And it's for the people to vote through a new voting system called quadratic voting, uh, the importance uh, of those sustainable development goals. So each project needs to correspond to one or more SDGs. And which project ends up making the cut uh, is determined by quadratic voting. So this system ensures that there's broad support for the project that actually gets the coaching for the tri trilingual, like tri-sectoral, cross-sectoral uh, coaching for the uh, competition. And the five winners every year of the hackathon, they don't receive any money as a prize. Rather, they receive a trophy, which is the shape of Taiwan, um, with a micro projector that when turned on projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, handing the trophy to you. So it's a self-describing trophy. Uh, and that represents the presidential promise that whatever you did for the past three months, we will make it happen either locally or uh, on a national scale in the next 12 months. Uh, and this is very important because there's many good social innovations that just needed this sort of presidential commitment that makes this kind of planning happen. So for this year alone, there's, uh, I think, three urban planning related winners out of the five champions. There's one called Patch by Planting. They use AR tools on the phone and also on tablets and so on to look at unused lands that's owned by the state or one of the state's subsidiaries and plan what will happen if we plant trees there. Uh, and so this is really a great tool for people to envision a scenario together and commit to taking care to the trees and for, for the trees to to talk back. Well, not like the movie Avatar, but <laughs> to kind of share uh, the, the kind of health uh, indicators of the trees so that the local government do not have to assume all the maintenance cost of uh, working with the gardening, but the local people can join as well. And they, uh, thanks to winning the presidential hackathon, is already working on the ground. Uh, with the Taoyuan City Municipality Council on that. And there's also one uh, called Circuit Plus um, that use, again, a map. There's something about maps in Taiwanese civic tech. Um, a map of nearby uh, drinking water places, like water fountains and so on, but also local businesses that want to provide water for free. And we call it Feng Cha or tea serving, referring to the, this um, ancient Taiwanese tradition of offering free water to the passers by. Uh, and so people who want to refill their bottles can just use this uh, app, like a Pokemon Go, uh, to go to the nearby station to check it in, to rate on the uh, flavor or warmth of the, the water served there, uh, to connect to each other, to earn some coins, to redeem the coins, uh, to win some mission uh, and go to on a local tour and things like that. And all the while, just making it a habit of refilling their bottles rather than buying new plastic. Uh, and the same app has been connected to another champion of this year, which will then send you push notification uh, to engage more with the local drinking places when there's excess heat uh, to not suffer from heat damage uh, and things like that. So this is essentially a uh, placemaking tool, but masquerading as something like Pokemon Go a game and that will enable more community engagement and things like that so that's three out of the five champions i just briefly describe but please feel free to check out at the presidential hackathon website great, great. it's great you mentioned uh Patch by planning i actually know the team that's behind the project uh it, it is an amazing project awesome that's a tip uh you're probably the most experienced on, on this question what 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 has been your experience uh, you mean in terms of the, the digital one or the, the other public spaces that are still physical? Because uh, uh, yes, in uh, terms of the digital, I believe uh, 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 Minister Tang is, is much more experienced in this. Right? Um, no, um, 
I would say that uh, uh, we we see now, of course, uh, uh, also with our students and so on, more and more are kind of working on on uh, making kind of apps for for public spaces and so on. But I think it's still kind of a longer way to go, and we see in general still a certain kind of fatigue, either a fatigue in in terms of um, public participation because people feel like there's uh, maybe. It, it takes too long time until they really see kind of positive outcome from from those points uh, or or also don't trust maybe that it's, it's really making a big change um in uh, we see on the other hand uh, much more people kind of working with with kind of using um, games and so on in in the process of uh, public engagement and so on but i think many of them are not only digital but also uh, physical right um but uh, but i think that i see there a kind of big trend now uh, in in architecture schools or in colleagues and, and and so on to to work with that and uh, which is kind of encouraging um to, we just need to see like how how these things become kind of implemented and so on right mm -hmm. yeah. kevin what, what are your thoughts um well i think you know you mentioned civic engagements in your question and i think for something like that, digital tools are definitely helpful, though maybe might not be a panacea. Um, mm -hmm. So they can like augment civic engagement in terms of, um, for instance, if you have very user-centered platforms and services, you can try to collect citizen feedback or sentiments, um, and then try to use these to support participatory planning. Um, I actually think the minister has worked on some really interesting stuff, so would actually love to kind of hear more um, about that uh, from the minister. But um, I think, when we talk about engagements, um, the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Authority in Singapore, for example, has increasingly tried to experiment with some different modes of engagement in order to incorporate more grassroots voices or make planning itself more participatory. Um, I think the Parks Board has also, National Parks Board has also used participatory methods to identify features for new parks they're designing. Um, I think out of all these exercises, the real key is transforming our understanding of what engagement is, because it's not a pro forma exercise. Right? It's really, we should see it as something that can help us better understand a problem and better understand human needs and then craft solutions that respond to them. Um, and I think um, really take a lot of inspiration from what you might call design thinking or human-centered design, where we really try to understand the users before developing solutions. Um, and so it's not, engagement isn't just, here's my solution, now I go out and engage, right? It's actually trying to understand the user in the first place. Um, and that type of engagement um, and understanding really helps us uncover what the real problem we're grappling with is, um, even before we start generating uh, new ideas and solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so Mr. Tan mentioned this uh, project, uh, Patch by Planting, and, and uh, so there is a kind of a, a digital uh, a platform as a medium, but ultimately, trees still need to be planted. Right, so the the actual space is still there, and so we have you know talk a quite a bit about uh, you know, the digital dimensions already. What about the continuing uh, significance of, of actual physical space? Uh, you know, space of assembly, uh, gathering. You know, the hackathons still take place in actual physical space, right? Uh, I, I just actually attended the Golf Zero meeting in Taiwan recently. Uh, it's a, it's a you know, wonderful gathering. Uh, so, so what what is what is the future of public space uh, in the age of uh, technology and social media? Uh, maybe Professor Tiban, you can uh, you're, you're the yeah. expert on this. What yeah. do you? Um, well, I think that uh, if we if we can frame it like let's say for example the is there another public space after. The, in the for the new normal right uh, um and uh, for that i would say the experience uh, experience of i would say uh taiwan and hong kong show that we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel that uh, uh we need to have spaces for social distancing right because wearing this and kind of being kind of responsible <laughs> and so on right uh, and and we don't have a lockdown, right? Uh, in Hong Kong, is uh, no real lockdown. In Taiwan, wasn't uh, a lockdown, right? So I think in in terms of the um, if it's, if public space need to be fundamentally different, I'm not sure because still it is important for people to come together, right? But what we see is I think that investment into 
certain kind of projects. Um, I think uh, on one hand, uh, uh, certain kind of green or green boot kind of uh, systems, networks that allow kind of alternative forms of traveling through cities, right, uh, can be very successful, right, uh, because they, they really provide places, uh, breathing spaces, but also kind of to calm down and so on. So when I was in um, Taipei, I used extensively this, uh, uh, these areas of the kind of artificial wetlands and so on. And, and you could see everyone is, uh, and then of course you can uh, very easily get a bike and, and, and bike around and so on. I think these spaces obviously uh, help a lot in those kind of problematic uh, moments, right? Uh, so, uh, Hong Kong has this in some parts where I live. I'm lucky where my university is. It, it works actually very well. And these, but these were planned in the 1970s, interestingly. Um, but uh, today, not necessarily uh, uh, would be uh, implemented new in other areas. No? So, so uh, I think this is very valuable. Um, and the other thing is, of course, again, this question of. Um, uh, health disparity and so on uh, to see like particularly in the in the worst neighborhoods how we can help them because usually uh, that's also where then not those kind of spaces are provided and so on right and and where people live so crowded for example here that that the need is much much higher right uh, maybe I leave it with that for the moment <laughs> sorry okay uh, perhaps uh, uh, Kevin. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it'll still be very useful to have physical public spaces. I think uh, people want to meet. Um, I think when William White was studying New York, right, his seminal uh, kind of um, research on, on public spaces in New York, um, what really attracted people to places was the presence of other people. Um, and I think what we're seeing, though, in pandemic times is when you want to be outside, you might actually want to be spaced away from others. So you still need public space that can accommodate that. Um, and then also we kind of talked a little bit earlier about having public space to exercise in. And that really means that the quality of public space matters. You can't just have like a small pocket park near your house and then you know check off the list and say, oh, this neighborhood has access to um, public space, right? Because that space needs to be sufficient to actually accommodate the type of activities people want to take on, right? So it's, it needs to be kind of broadly available to everybody and then also of sufficient quality so people can actually um, do the activities that um, are important to them, whether it's during a pandemic or perhaps after. Uh, so I think really for urban designers um, in the future when they're designing these public spaces, um, it's just gonna have to be a lot more flexible um, so they can be useful both for pandemic times when people wanna space out and find solitude or you know, sometimes you might even have to convert it into like a field hospital or quarantine site. Um, and then non-pandemic times when people actually want to gather together and be social. So, so being able to accommodate. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister Tan, uh, so what, what do you think uh, what, the interface between public space and, uh, uh, and digital governance? Yeah, uh, I'll just share with you my, my office, like, like literally my office. Um, so um, if the people who, who help uh, the show uh, can help putting on the presentation that I just shared, uh, you will see uh, literally my office and um, here, yes. So <laughs> this is uh, the Social Innovation Lab, literally at the heart of Taipei City. Uh, and this place is drawn, the public art is drawn by people with Down syndrome, with trisomy differences. Um, and so while, of course, I look at the world and see, I guess, UML diagrams or category theory arrows or, I don't know, raining uh, numbers, uh, the people with Down syndrome see the world like Van Gogh, uh, like with connected geometries and topology. Um, and so by making sure that the space is open to everyone, we literally tore down the walls because this um, used to be Air Force headquarters. So anyone can walk in and engage uh, in social innovation work. And I'm here like every Wednesday from uh, 10 a.m. to the evening. So anyone can book 40 minutes of my time to talk about social innovation matters. Uh, and so this is actually a connected space. So this connects to like five other social innovation labs across the country. So that when we uh, tour around island, for example, I will go on the social innovation tours and uh, I will meet people uh, like empower people um, who are 
farthest away from Taipei City uh, and then just meet them uh, at their regular town hall, sometimes with cultural interpreters, uh, if it's indigenous. Uh, and then in the social innovation lab, 12 ministries gather uh, and just in a kind of immersive co-creation experience, just listen to the people who share about their locality. And this is important because too often people in the central government just read uh, the descriptions of the issues brought up by the local people so they can fix that and solve those problems in the abstract but actually create more problems <laughs> for people on the ground but if uh, they can listen to the whole story and instead of sending you know powerpoints or word documents actually we're more into open documents uh, around um, then uh, actually they can uh, co-create with the local people and the local people will feel um, that they're much more close uh, to other connected spaces. So a physical space like this is important to inspire people to think outside of the box to, to hack existing policies, if you will. Uh, talk about hacking, there was a visitor to the space, uh, a pirate, uh, really, uh, the mayor of Prague, uh, Zdenik Hrybe, uh, of Pirate Party, uh, and this is uh, his um, small cabinet, uh, and they get so inspired that they just they climb on those grids that are not designed for climbing uh, and while holding the sustainable development goals uh, cards uh, and uh, took a picture together. I was smiling kind of nervously because we've never tested that. Uh, and so I was afraid they may fall, but they did not. Uh, and so <laughs> this is how inspired people get just by virtue of showing up in the co-creation space. And we can connect many of these together. Then we'll feel closer to each other than ever before. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so now we know uh, where to find Minister Tan on Wednesdays. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, always in the Social Innovation Lab. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so you kind of gave away my, my next question. <laughs> uh, we have talked quite a bit about uh, governance already, uh, but uh, for those who, who know my own work, uh, which is focused on bottom-up urbanism, uh, I'm actually more interested in the notion of hacking. Uh, so, so Mr. Tan is a... Uh, Currently, uh, perhaps former uh, civic hacker, uh, what can the government, government or governance learn from the community of civic hackers? And uh, what, what are some of the lessons uh, of civic hacking for the public sphere? Yeah, I want to pick up on the earlier note of design thinking, uh, because in design thinking, it's kind of um, the digital tools are great to help us discover more and also more effectively define common values. That's what the digital technologies really assist us. But on the development and the delivery, of course, that takes time and also space. Uh, and so this is like the, the usual view of things. Mm -hmm. But I think hacking is very interesting because it kind of reverses the time, like in a movie tenant. Uh, and so you can go with a system that's already in development, but then you think uh, repurposing it in a different way. Uh, and then you think uh, in a backward notion to redefine and rediscover what a system might also be good for. Uh, so in a sense, the Gov Zero movement, G0 v the TW, which you actually participate in one of our hackathons, is just about looking at all the digital services in Taiwan uh, by the government, which uh, is something that G O v the TW, and change a O to a zero. And then you get into the kind of shadow government like join the GOV.TW, become join the G0V.TW, which is always more fun and engaging and so on. And people go on a journey of uh, redefining together and rediscovering together, but it's always into the commons because we always use creative commons and open source and free software um, to uh, work on those alternate visions. Uh, and so when those alternate visions, it could be budget visualization, it could be a transcultural dictionary, it could be many other things. Um, with the governments likes it, well, they can just merge. So forking is uh, with a aim to be eventually merged. And I think this uh, makes this diamond uh, like a, a pincer movement, uh, if you have watched the movie, uh, so that we can all work together in both directions. That's great. So we're really talking about, uh, you mentioned the term shadow government. We're really talking about you know, people creating you know, the government on their own terms. Mm -hmm. That's right, exactly. Uh, like uh, self-empowering uh, the governance, which is why uh, GovZero people usually talk about governance instead of government, uh, right. because it's a pluralistic take on governance. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. So uh, maybe Kevin, uh, I don't know how, if you do any hacking uh, on the side where you're a closet hacker, uh, 
hacker. Uh, what, 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 what are your thoughts? Um, so I guess I can focus on kind of a physical analog to this, um, kind of in the realm of placemaking, which we could call tactical urbanism. Um, and I definitely, you know, there is a role for bottom-up participation in the planning of cities and the making and shaping of cities. Um, I think especially we need this because um, a population may be quite diverse and you want to give people agency to shape their neighborhoods. Um, and so globally, um, there's a lot of interest in placemaking and um, in particular kind of uh, one way that this is accomplished is through tactical urbanism where people actually make small interventions in their neighborhood. And if it's worked, um, it then might become formalized by the city. And so um, some cities are welcoming this trend of experimenting and it's a, it's a physical experiment, right? It is not necessarily a digital one, but there um, is kind of uh, physical making. And then um, these prototypes that go out on the street and um, San Francisco even has like a prototyping festival where artists and designers are able to um, try out prototypes um, with the public um, with the sanction of the city uh, for a few days uh, during the year. And then, um, oh yeah, and then um, Professor O actually has um, a, a good book on um, some of this um, placemaking and kind of guerrilla urbanism that folks may want to check out. Mm -hmm. um, I think one last point about this is that um, for cities broadly, then the critical question is, um, how do we activate the public to participate in these types of experiments? Um, and I think it can be really helpful as too, if we're thinking about post pandemic, can people be part of rebuilding after it, right? So what kind of role can they take in revitalizing neighborhoods, revitalizing the economy? Um, and I really think that participatory placemaking is a great way to channel that energy for the public benefits. And then if you are hoping to do something that is participatory, um, you, you do have to remember as a city that uh, part of this is about accessibility. How do you make processes open and more welcoming to folks? Um, it is about, in part, using more open source tools. So perhaps a broader range of people can participate um, and explicitly inviting people, um, sharing data, sharing knowledge. So people aren't starting from zero. Right, right. Um, Professor Tiban, you have actually done quite a few placemaking projects. Yeah. With your students at uh, Chinese U, uh, what's your take on hacking? Uh -huh. Well, um, I would, of course, we can say that that maybe uh, that uh, some of those kind of placemaking projects uh, are maybe if we if we use uh, Kevin's way of kind of uh, saying that tactical urbanism is a bit kind of linked to it, then I think that uh, many things that. Um, people have tried out also in Hong Kong and, and we were part of, of that in a way uh, might have uh, uh, made kind of steps in this direction. I think the, the most important thing is then of course at some point and this maybe also with this go uh, the, the different governing uh, pages right how they uh, merge right and um, I think for us what was very interesting when we traveled last year with our students uh, to to study this um, um, New York City uh, Public Plaza program, um, which was one of the, the programs um, or projects that was launched by Bloomberg, who who also created Hudson Yards and maybe one of the most exclusive <laughs> uh, projects in New York. But on the other hand, that particular program, I think uh, the, the Plaza program was quite quite interesting because it basically encouraged communities to propose projects and then help them, basically the, the transport department that then would actually roll out and, and build those things, uh, but with the community input, uh, of course, famously from community organizers from the Queens Museum in Corona Plaza and so on. And then we went back to to those places only online now during the pandemic because we couldn't travel, but uh, we looked at it during the pandemic together with with uh, Miodra Mitrosinovic, our partner in Parsons in New York. Um, and what we found out that during the pandemic, those places that were really created in some of the, the most impoverished maybe neighborhoods, also with the, my, uh, the most cases of, of COVID, but that in those places, those uh, uh, community public spaces that were co-created, um, they had an important role, not necessarily being used as public space, but because of the community networks that they created. And these would also then become the help networks under the pandemic right um and uh, which was very uh interesting to see and very encouraging that this is an interesting way to bring this together 
vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, projects like, uh, of course, uh, the Highline that is kind of beautiful and so on and started as a, as a citizen project, but uh, also uh, changed a little bit and was one of the first projects that was closed, right, uh, and cost millions of dollars and so on. While those kind of uh, mix of hack and and uh, uh, government, right? Um, they they seem to be quite valuable in this uh, these moments. Right? One one uh, question I would have maybe for for uh, Minister Tang uh, is like uh, now when you are because now you are on the on the other side, right? Uh, did you have situations that that your work was hacked in a way that that made you uncomfortable and so on? Because uh, uh, of course, oh, yeah, it, definitely. It very good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and not in a good way. I mean, yeah. when, when we uh, first decided to roll out a open API for the real-time mask inventory in all pharmacies, uh, I mean, this is because I believe in open API and our procurement rule is written so that vendor system integrator cannot discriminate against robots. So they have to offer an API in addition to a human interface. Um, so uh, this is all well and good. And that enabled then two social innovations, two hacks, if you will. One is the visualization, the real-time map, which is good, I guess, because it helps people to find a pharmacy that still have masks. But one is by the pharmacists themselves, who invented uh, in, uh, and both happened on February 6th, um, the pharmacists uh, invented take a number system because they don't uh, want to process uh, linearly uh, the um, national health cards. So many pharmacies started to offer those small numbers plates uh, so that people who queue in line just trade in their national health cards to those numbers. Uh, maybe they started saying, you know, we start getting the queue from uh, 7 a.m. and all the way to 8 a.m. and then we hand out all those numbers, but they tell those people to go back uh, in 7 p.m. or something to collect the masks while they process uh, their health cards uh, during the lunch break uh, as to not interfere with their um, drug dispensing business because they still have a drug dispensing business going on. Uh, so this is great social innovation. It saves them time, everybody time. This is great social innovation. It saves everybody time. But taken together, they clash because from the mask maps viewpoint, this pharmacy have completely availability except during lunch where it drops to zero. And, and so the map become not useful at all in the pharmacies that have introduced uh, take a number system. So the two hacks um, cancel each other out and makes the trustworthiness uh, kind of a net loss for everyone who practiced both uh, in the first time. And so I even had a nearby pharmacy uh, who paint uh, using this A4 papers, one character per, uh, per paper, so really large letters, uh, that was saying, don't trust the app, exclamation mark, with the exclamation mark on its own A4 paper. Uh, and so, of course, it was very frustrating. Like, people were hacking in two different ways, and they were opposing each other, uh, kind of. Um, but Fortunately, one of the uh, civic tech people, uh, the name is Fin Jian Kiang, who is the second person to make their map based on OpenStreetMap. The first one is called Howard Wu. Fin Jian Kiang's map has a place, a form, for the pharmacist to uh, file in their feedback information. So there's a lot of frustration, a lot of ad hominem attacks and so on. But if when I browse through them all and suffer through them all, I, I see one really good nugget of idea saying, hey, why don't my map display two time slots? One for getting the numbers and one for getting the map, uh, the masks. And, and of course, uh, I'm like like Eureka and thank you, uh, random pharmacists, because it was anonymous. Uh, and uh, so we implemented right away the very next week uh, the two data points so that uh, they can announce they're open from seven to eight for the numbers and then seven to eight in the PM for the masks. And so that puts some end to this um, canceling out. But on the other hand, uh, if they hand out all the numbers by say 7.30, then that's still 30 minutes of time that they're on the map with inaccurate numbers. So one of the pharmacists told me, uh, Minister, why don't you just put a button here that says disappear from the map? So as soon as I run out of those numbers, I'll just click this button and then nobody will call me. Uh, and actually there's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and so by amplifying this on the ground, social innovation, we empower people who are literally closer to the front line, the queuing lines. Um, and once we implement that idea, they stop canceling each other and then uh, started uh, to get pharmacies into a much more cozy place. And that in all took three weeks. 
Um, and so, of course, I'm very fortunate to to kind of survive through it. <laughs> but the frustration, I guess, is turned into the spirit of co-creation after all. Right. right. So co-creation and, and open source uh, is That's right. getting That's right. right. All right. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're going to transition to a, a Q and A. Uh, so mm -hmm. for those who are uh, now watching uh, this conversation uh, in front of your screen uh, on YouTube, you can type in uh, questions um, to the right. Uh, so we have uh, quite, and we also have uh, collected quite a few questions through uh, the registration, and uh, and there's actually quite a lot of questions on on this issue of uh, privacy. And, and, and we just talk about your know, national health insurance card uh, in Taiwan, and, and you know I think uh, this is something that has been on people's mind. Uh, so one question: uh, What specific you know, ethical frameworks uh, do you use for digital governance? Um, you know, and uh, in, in this, uh, one person mentioned this uh, example in Korea, where you know, credit cards, transactions, and security cameras. Uh, uh, now being used to conduct uh, contact tracing. Uh, how do countries in Asia use digital governance uh, differently? Uh, what has been the you know, experience in, in Taiwan to you know, pr you know, protect personal data? So perhaps Minister Tan can, can uh, start with, with that. Sure. It's not so much a framework rather than a heuristic. During the mm -hmm. pandemic, we simply say the government should not set up new data collection endpoints that was not there before the pandemic period. Uh, and this has its reason because we've never declared a state of emergency. So we're still operating under constitutional law system instead of this, you know, ad hoc um, uh, permission by the, sorry, forgiveness by the parliament. We have to seek permission from the parliament for each and every work that we do because we never declare a state of emergency. Um, and so we can only work with the cybersecurity and privacy parameters, the data collection points that was already there before the pandemic. So for example, handing out those tokens, uh, the trace together tokens in Singapore has been considered, but never deployed in Taiwan, partly because we never had a community spread, but partly because that would constitute a new data collection point. So mm -hmm. we had to work with, for example, the pharmacist, which are already handing out their um, refillable prescriptions uh, based on the national health card. So the collection point is already there. It's just a new way to apply this data, right? Uh, and also during the digital quarantine, instead of working on Bluetooth or GPS or uh, Wi-Fi based more precise location systems, we basically made uh, use of the cell phone tower signal strength, which is already used, uh, although it was very coarse uh, parameter like 50 meter radius uh, resolution, um, it's already used for advanced earthquake warnings. People who don't receive those warnings even say that they're kind of nationally forgotten border people or something. Uh, so, but nowadays people do receive those earthquake warnings uh, quite well um, in advance, like seconds uh, before the actual earthquake hits. And there's also the flood evacuation warnings and things like that. So people understand this will not read your application level message. This will not interfere um, with your GPS. You can uh, receive the earthquake warnings even with the GPS and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi all turned off. Uh, and so basically this is a existing data collection point, the signal strength that's already well understood by the citizenry. And so we have to make do with whatever we have uh, based on this heuristic. Otherwise we will have to pass new laws and new um, approvals by the parliament, which could be a much more lengthy process. Mm -hmm. Now, Kevin, have you come across any ethical uh, questions or issues in Singapore or elsewhere? Um, I think probably if you're talking about um, how we think about using digital tools or algorithms, um, I think that is something that we can think about and especially thinking um, through like what maybe the limitations of digital tools are. Um, one thing that's, um, you know, is that it's important to have like perhaps more transparency around algorithms, like when they're used and then also um, how they're actually being encoded instead of just letting them be black boxes. I think sometimes they can be a bit um, mysterious. And um, I guess um, the minister mentioned kind of a heuristic. And I guess the idea too is that um, these tools aren't separate from human beings. And so it's really helpful to have human beings who understand um, and know when to apply the right tools at the right times. Um, 
And for instance, there may be times when machine learning methods actually are quite useful, um, but we also should understand bias. Um, I think a computer science department recently was found to have been using um, algorithms to rank PhD candidates instead of really having the full set of readers, human readers for the applications. And I think some critics were a bit, uh, well, they were rightly concerned that this could potentially perpetuate biases um, by the software developers who actually coded those algorithms, right? So I think um, just kind of thinking through some of these issues can be helpful. Um, another kind of thing that, you know, oftentimes we sell algorithms as, oh, it can be very time saving. Um, and that's definitely true, but it can also like obscure um, what we're really aiming to reach for when we rely on a digital method. Um, and I, I think essentially you have to make sure that the system actually is accounting for the things you truly value. Um, and so from a planning perspective, for example, like actually being on the ground, engaging with the community, understanding their needs, hopes, and aspirations, like there's not many good substitutes for that. Um, it's a very in important and fundamental part of planning, um, but it takes time and it requires being thoughtful, right? And so, um, you know, it, it may not, it just, it just might require more time to be spent on that. Um, I think my last point on this is just that um, we can be, we just wanna be careful not to over rely on optimization methods because they're helpful as guides. Um, but I think that's the key, they're guides, they're not prescriptions. And so there's still room for human beings to be planners, especially when we're trying to understand communities or balance different choices or make trade-offs. And I would say that the best tools actually empower planners to spend more time pondering over the right questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have quite a few questions on, on this uh, issue of uh, uh, inclusivity. Uh, and this, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, you know, that, uh, the group that could be uh, characterized as uh, digitally uh, excluded. Uh, so the, the question uh, was, uh, how can public engagement on uh, digital platforms be truly inclusive in terms of uh, age, uh, social, economic spectrum of the public? Um, anyone? Perhaps uh, we, can, we can always start with Ms. Uh, Minister Tan. Yeah, okay, uh, mm -hmm. so the answer is very carefully. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, in, in Taiwan, uh, for example, our 5G spectrum, we, we designed the auction uh, algorithm, <laughs> the mechanism, uh, really, really carefully so that we make sure that the telecoms do pay for the actual values uh, that they will create um, through those 5G spectrums. As a result of that, we have a lot more money uh, than the original like minimum price uh, when getting the 5G spectrum. And then we dedicate, earmark those price, um, the spectrum auction price to the expense of basically subsidizing the work on not only communication, but also health and education in the most rural and unconnected places. So, so much so that we would say, uh, the more remote you are, the more advanced you become. And this is important because then those purpose-driven businesses will be attracted to the places that actually need it the most, where the broadband application uh, and, um, for example, using uh, drones for to deliver um, pharmacy prescriptions um, is not a nice to have, it's a actually must have, because they have to spend maybe uh, two hours or more on public transportation to a nearby pharmacy and so on. And so basically, this way of designing with intentionality, using market design and mechanism design to make sure that the, these are the uh, public commons, the, the social uh, common capital uh, that everybody agrees uh, on those three areas where a social democracy, everything else where liberal democracy, but these are social democracy. This then creates a market to, for example, the startups that want to prove <clears throat> their merits of service without necessarily a business model in a competitive marketplace in the municipalities, but they can prove the social impact first and become a purpose-driven business or social entrepreneurship, as we call it here. Uh, and I think having a robust social entrepreneurship landscape and social investment landscape then encourages a more uh, like sustainable capital and patient capital to enroll into markets so the state doesn't have to subsidize everything, but as they need to take the lead on those uh, issues like health and education and communication, where it is actually the state's responsibility to be a social democracy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Professor Thieben, what, uh, I mean, you have quite 
uh, have done quite a bit of work in community engagement. Uh, are there things that we can, you know, that the, the digital uh, you know, governance uh, realm can learn from uh, community engaged design in, uh, to, to make the process more, more inclusive? Well, I think that in, in Hong Kong, I think that the mo most important point is maybe that, that we have programs also for social innovation and we have a lot of on the on the grassroots level and NGO level I think a lot of uh, very interesting initiatives and uh, they are but not necessarily only using digital tools but also maybe also using conventional tools but um, just to see like how can they be kind of scaled up or really affect the mainstream right uh, because uh, uh, in if we see our kind of a very uh, strong kind of uh, wealth gap uh, and and uh, the very high Guinea factor in Hong Kong and so on, right? That um, it seems kind of difficult to make a kind of very critical change of this kind of bigger the bigger framework, right? Um, so so I think I'm I'm I think there are a lot of kind of innovations that are happening on this kind of more. A smaller level, also sometimes through government programs or universities and and other or private uh, uh, um, initiatives, right? Uh, but then, basically, then there is it's almost a kind of a disconnect then to 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 bring this into other parts, so, which is maybe not. Uh, it's it's a bit easy to say that is everything in the system is like this because if we look at the housing system in, in in Hong Kong public housing, for example, is sometimes even on a, on a very high level, uh, from its quality to a certain extent, right? Uh, and is is creating a certain kind of inclusion, maybe to to or, or at least like providing something uh, um, of of public benefit. But uh, but uh, in in there are many levels where there is this kind of disconnect, and it, it would need. A kind of more a better way to to basically create and the link from those ones into the kind of larger impact uh, systems, right? And uh, which maybe is kind of interesting that uh, what happened with this kind of go <laughs> the, the two different the, the shadow websites and so on. So so something like this doesn't doesn't really exist here, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin, what do you think? What, what uh, how can we make the platforms more inclusive? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I think for the creators, especially, uh, it's useful to remember that you're not only programming for yourself or people who are like you. Um, so how do you really think about the broad spectrum of users and what their needs are? Um, accessibility, I think, is incredibly important. Um, one helpful way of doing that is to work directly with those minority communities themselves to make sure that, for instance, an app works for people who are visually impaired. Um, another kind of really important uh, feature to keep note of, especially if you live in a multilingual society, is that uh, perhaps English or perhaps Mandarin may not necessarily be people's first language. And so how do you make sure that uh, whatever resource you're offering is actually available to people um, from different linguistic backgrounds? Uh, that way, it'll really be accessible, especially if you're trying to reach those populations. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so let me see. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how can digital governance uh, fend against uh, threats to democracy? Uh, over the last few days, we have heard about you know uh, hacking from from Russian uh, in uh, in the United States, uh, and then this is not the first time it has happened. And there are other form of uh, threats, uh, you know, like the softer side in terms of just uh, you know like things that are happening through social media and so forth. Uh, so, so how, uh, so what can we do to fend against these kind of threats, uh, Mr. Tan? How, how about you? Sure. Um, so, um, because uh, I understand we only have like twelve minutes left, I can't <laughs> call cybersecurity and disinformation. Uh, so I have to make choices uh, <laughs> since it's uh, more like um, a placemaking and digital governance. Uh, I think infodemic uh, is more pressing. Uh, and also less technical. So I'll focus on infodemic. Um, our counter infodemic playbook, which is um, counter infodemic with no takedowns, uh, is markedly different uh, from other playbooks uh, around the world. And I think this comes from this simple heuristic 
just like uh, people above 30 years old remember the lockdown of the Herping Hospital. And so we fight a pandemic and with just very simple heuristic, never go to lockdown because we know how bad it could be to the society. People who are 40 years old or older remember the martial law uh, and the takedowns and the censorship and the lack of uh, freedom on all fronts. And so people don't want to go back, uh, not even a little bit there. And so we have to fight a uh, infodemic uh, with no administrative takedown power, basically. Um, and so that basically means that we have to make sure that the vaccines of the mind uh, race against the disinformation and win. And this is very difficult, actually, because unless you can detect the uh, exponential <laughs> disinformation before it actually goes exponential, you need kind of like advanced warning system. Uh, because if you counter all the disinformation, there's no enough fact checkers or comedians or spoke stocks around. And if we focus only on the ones that have a R value above one, then there's sufficient uh, resource. But how do we know the R value of which misinformation will trend and become disinformation? So we also rely on crowdsourcing. In Taiwan, there's this a broad system called CoFacts, uh, which is also a Gov0 project. So Gov0 is in everything. Uh, so the CoFacts system basically makes sure that anyone can share with a simple long press, uh, a long click. Um, on their end-to-end -end encrypted channels, uh, so like WhatsApp, but here it's called Line, um, to the fact checkers. Uh, and it's crowdsourced, so anyone may join. So just like flagging your email as spam, this shows to a Line dashboards what kind of misinformation is now trending to on the verge of becoming uh, this information. And so the, the COFAC system, uh, which is also adapted in Thailand, so instead of COFACTS.org, which is in uh, Taiwan, uh, they removed it as, uh, and so if you go to COFACT.org, uh, you see the Thai version of the COFAC system. So uh, I put it on the uh, stream yard. Uh, and so just by uh, long pressing and sharing, we actually gained a kind of advanced warning of what this information will actually be trending two hours from now or so. So, and then we're given two hours to work. The fact checkers, the social sector people, the journalists have two hours to fact check that. The government, on the other hand, the competent ministries have two hours to work with comedians uh, to produce memes that are hilarious and funny uh, and make sure that, uh, you know, the emotions goes uh, from outrage to worrying, but then to joy because it's humorous. Um, so this uh, is a co-creational spirit instead of from outrage uh, to fear and then to disgust, which is the anti-social part uh, of the anti-social media. Uh, and so this is a race against time. It's hit and miss uh, at times, but I think by and large, we have now worked uh, a system out so that we can counter most of the trending or would be trending this information within two hours time into pictures, sometimes with very cute dogs and less than 200 characters. Uh, anyone else want to add? No, it's it's uh, kind of inspiring to, to see this, right? Uh, but of course, it's a question like, um, if you see it in, in larger scale, like for example, uh, we look at American uh, election at the moment, uh, all those kind of things, right? Uh, it's, you, you wonder how how on, on such larger scale those things can can function, right? Uh, um, um, because uh, it might not be possible to to react so fast and also because the audience is already so split, right? Uh, because I think that also has a lot to do with the question of a fundamental, uh, a kind of first trust in, in, in the government, right? Uh, that uh, maybe I think was was quite uh, uh, luckily quite quite positive I think when the uh, pandemic started to to hit in in Taiwan that uh, at the beginning it was also not so clear mm -hmm. if it was lost or not but but then also with the kind of TV uh, uh, um, um, response that you mentioned and so on that that helped a lot right but I think sometimes, if if you have political leadership that is, for example, not supporting that or undermining that, uh, as as we have seen with particular politicians in in uh, big countries, um, then then of course it's very very uh, difficult, right? Um, would you have any kind of 
uh, suggestions what one can do in, in this kind of more, you, you lived very long time in, in the US also, no? um, in such kind of context, how, how could you approach that? Um, well, if GovTech um, isn't helping, then yeah. civic tech takes over. I yeah. mean, that's why we occupy the parliament. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not saying that you should occupy your parliament. I'm definitely not saying that. Yeah. Uh, but but that uh, is essentially the, the grassroots response, right? So for the places where the top-down state uh, flat out didn't function well, actually, we had that, for example, mm -hmm back uh, around the turn of the century, when we're still at the very beginning of democratization on the first term of uh, Dr. Lee Dong Hui of the direct elected uh, president mm -hmm. in 1996, with a really huge earthquake, right? The September 21st earthquake. And that's, I think, that the event that connected the NPOs and charities and NGOs and co-ops and placemakers into the so-called social sector. There was no social sector before the earthquake to speak of on a national scale. There was a lot of local scale, of course, place making activities, but the earthquake really brought the social sector national because they fill in where the government cannot. They fill in where the government did wrong. They filled in when the government um, kind of abused uh, its asymmetry uh, in governing and things like that. And that made the social sector much more legitimate. I mean, even now, more than 20 years later, when there's a large earthquake and one of the charities involved in the original uh, September 21st um, earthquake published a number, uh, people still believe the charity's number, the social sector number, more than the municipal number. That That is true. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, that has been the experience in uh, elsewhere in, in Japan and even in China as well. The, the social the power of the social sector, especially in uh, situations after disasters. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Occupy. This, uh, maybe this, we'll, we'll use this as a last question. Uh, so the question uh, is like this. Uh, in the United, uh, United States, there is a stigma about around the world uh, anarchist. Uh, what does the word uh, anarchist means to you, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Minister Tan, uh, as a government minister? Uh, yeah. How do you draw upon your uh, anarchist principle uh, in your work? Yeah, I, I used to simply say I'm a Taoist, but then the people in the US seem to, to think that I, I don't know, practice Qigong or uh, <laughs> do some spiritual rituals, like the folk Taoist religion, which is great. Uh, I respect that. But that, that's not what I meant by saying that I'm a Taoist um, person. Uh, so, so then I came upon this idea of calling myself a conservative anarchist, uh, which is kind of just the um, philosophical Taoism, uh, but expressed in Western terms. Conservative in a sense that in the more than 20 national languages in Taiwan, each representing one or more tradition, I don't for a day want to make progress on one of those cultures to the expense of the other cultures, um, which is what used to happen during the martial law days um, to too much, right? Uh, and so the idea is to be cross-cultural. And I even called Zhonghua uh, Mingguo, the, the official name of the state, I translated it as the transcultural republic of citizens um, to highlight the idea of transculturalism and the conservative parts. Now the anarchist of this is very simple. I don't give orders and I don't take orders. I join the government to work with the government, not for the government, to work with the people, not for the people. Uh, and this is by voluntary association, radical transparency, location independence, um, forming the principle of the digital governance. Uh, but these principles I didn't invent on my own because these are the core internet governance uh, principles. Mm -hmm. Great. That, that's a, a great note to, to end on. Uh, it's been a wonderful one and a half hours. I, I've uh, personally learned a, a tremendous amount about uh, digital governance and, and civic engagement. Uh, we talk about you know, governance from the bottom. Uh, we, we talk about pharmacies, uh, you know, the everyday spaces, uh, and, and, and your idea about bringing technology to the people. And I think that's one you know, great uh, example and people becoming the government uh, themselves. So these are some uh, the, the greatest lessons I think uh, uh, for me, I'm sure for uh, a lot of people. Um, so uh, so thank you. Uh, well, that's all the time that we have uh, mm -hmm. for today. Uh, I uh, 
would like to first thank our speakers for joining us uh, this evening uh, in Taipei, uh, especially uh, Minister Tan, uh, for taking the time out of your bus very busy schedule, uh, and also uh, to both uh, Professor Tiban and, and Kevin uh, Su for uh, joining us from uh, Hong Kong and, and Singapore. I would also like to thank all of you watching uh, in front of the screen uh, right now, as well as our staff, uh, Infan Chan and uh, Jennifer Joy uh, from uh, the EW Talent Studies program, uh, who have been working behind the, uh, the screen. And, uh, and we hope to see you again at another uh, UW Talent Studies uh, event uh, in the future. Uh, so thank you and uh, good night from Taipei. Yeah. Thanks, Bye-bye. It's 9 o'clock.